The name of this video is Infinite Line Revisited. In fact, we already solved the problem on an, of an infinitely charged line. However, in that case, we solve it by means of Coulomb's law and the superposition principle, whereas in this video, we are going to solve it by means of Gauss's theorem. However, Gauss's theorem alone is not sufficient to solve this problem. This is a typical mistake that many students do. They think that this problem is solved readily by means of Gauss's theorem. Gauss's theorem, as it turns out, happens to be useful only at the very last moment when solving this problem. The key item of all these problems, of all this problem, is the use of symmetries. And that's what three quarters of this, of this video will be about, with only the last quarter about Gauss's theorem. Eventually, we will make a connection between symmetries, symmetry arguments, that is, and the irrotational property of the electrostatic field, which we studied in a few minutes ago. All right, so we consider again an infinite straight line of charge. So let's sketch it here. Okay, this is our infinite line of charge. Let's uh, sketch here a cylinder which encloses this line. This is only for reference now. Eventually, we're going to use it for Gauss's theorem at the end. So let me sketch this cylinder here. Okay, this line is characterized by a linear charge density lambda, which we assume to be constant. We want to find the electrostatic field E at any point in space, let's say this point capital P right here. In order to solve this problem, as always, the first step is to identify a suitable coordinate system, which, as we already know in this case, is going to be a cylindrical coordinate system. The R axis, let's center it in the middle of this cylinder. So let's say that this is the center O of our R axis. In order to sketch it properly, let's also sketch the center of this circle up here. Right. So now we can properly sketch our coordinate system. So if this is our R axis, this is the origin of the coordinate system. Bar phi is measured in a counterclockwise fashion as such. And finally, this represents our Z axis. So as always, the first step was to identify a suitable coordinate system, in this case, O, R, bar phi, Z, a cylindrical coordinate system. To give here some three-dimensionality, we can do this, so that it looks more clear that it's three-dimensional. Okay. This point here is our observation point, capital P, where we place the test charge Q0, as always. What is the second step to solve any problem in electromagnetism? and physics in general, is to identify all the components with respect to this coordinate system of the electrostatic field E. And so how do we do that? At this observation point capital P, in this coordinate system, we must have in general three components, R, phi, and Z. For example, this will be our E, 
R component, vector ER. This will be our phi component, E vector bar phi. And finally, this will be our Z component, E vector Z. Now we can safely write capital P here, which is now in the way of all these vectors. That's the observation point. There we want to compute this field, so we know that in general, the field, step two, E, comprises a point capital P, three component, ER, plus E bar phi, plus E Z. Suppose that we have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever on any of these components, even though we already solved this problem by means of Coulomb's law and the superposition principle. And in that video, we found that in this case only as one component, the ER component. Now we want to forget about all that, restart from scratch. We hypothesize that in principle, all three components exist. The next step, as always, is to identify the degrees of freedom, step three. D O F. How do we proceed in this case to identify the degrees of freedom? This is the key part of this problem. In order to identify the DOFs in this case, we must take advantage of all possible symmetries associated with an infinite straight line. Okay, what are these symmetries? First of all, if I look at the line from above, I'm an observer which is observing a line charged with a lambda which is constant, so it's all uniform, uniformly charged. If I rotate this line, this is the trace of the line in front of me, if I rotate it in this fashion, clockwise or counterclockwise of any arbitrary angle, the line remains, from my perspective, exactly the same. Which means the first symmetry that we are going to use to solve this problem is a rotation symmetry by any angle about the line itself. So we can rotate the line counterclockwise or clockwise by any angle. So this is a rotation by any angle theta about the line, which, for example, we can call gamma. All right, so this is our first symmetry. What is the second symmetry we can identify for this line? Let's look at the line from the side. I'm observing this line, and it doesn't matter if I observe it from any angle. Um, when I translate it up and down by any displacement, and by any angle, of course, the line remains exactly the same. So it doesn't matter, since it's infinite, if we displace it upward by a certain amount or downward by a certain amount, completely arbitrary, the line remains exactly the same. So the second symmetry is a translation symmetry by any displacement upward or downward. Okay? So this is, uh, let's split them, translation, Relation symmetry upward or downward by any amount. There is one more symmetry that we want to use in order to solve this problem. What is the last symmetry? This is my infinite line. Suppose that this point here, where I'm holding the line, in this case this pencil with my fingers, this is a pivot or prime. So if I rotate by minus or plus pi this line around this pivot O prime, as an external observer, the line again looks exactly the same. Okay, so in this case, I consider here a pivot O prime and I can perform a rotation by any by an angle minus or plus pi 
around this point, which can be in fact any point along the line because of the translation symmetry. So let's leave them again. So this is a rotation by minus or plus pi around about O prime. Okay? This is the last symmetry we can use to solve this problem. The critical thing to remember here is that whatever we do, everything has to be, at the end of the day, consistent with all these three symmetries. Okay? So in fact, we are going to first use the first two symmetries to find some properties of this component of the electrostatic field, and eventually we are going to verify, by means of the last symmetry, whether these symmetries were consistent or not with each other. If they are consistent, and this will become more clear in a few minutes what I mean with that, then that component of the electrostatic field can exist. If they are inconsistent, it cannot exist, it has to be zero. So it's a consistency check that we need to do to really use these symmetries properly. And as it turns out, unfortunately, in many textbooks, pretty much in all textbooks I've seen available out there, no one really delves into the details of how to use these symmetries properly. For me, it's extremely important, and we should really look at this carefully. All right, so how do we do that? The, third, the fourth step to solve any problem, as we know, the fourth step is uh, to uh, actually calculate quantitatively what these various components are. And so the first thing we want to do, we want to examine these components as much as possible, we want to learn as much as possible about them using these symmetries. And only at the end we are going to use Gauss's theorem, only after we know as much as possible about them with these symmetries. So, let us focus first on the component ER, and let's make a sketch which will comprise two parts, one for the rotation symmetry and one for the translation symmetry, and then down here we're going to discuss about the consistency with the last rotation symmetry about the pivotal prime. So, let's proceed as follows. So this is our line here, gamma. Let's center it somewhere here, okay? So let's sketch a circle in 3D. So you need to look at this in 3D. So the circle I'm about to sketch it, of course, it would be like this from above. I'm looking with an angle, so it looks like an ellipse, as always. Okay. So let's pick a point P, capital P here, and perhaps let's pick two diametrically opposed points P prime and P double prime right there. At the same time, let me already start the sketch on this side. So we want to proceed in this fashion. All right, so now let's sketch our line here. Okay, this is our line gamma. As always, this is the center here. So let's sketch our circle here. This point right here is my observation point capital P. Now, to use the symmetries, the first symmetry is this rotation symmetry. So this is our line gamma, this is our line gamma. Okay. Let us sketch. So here, we want to use the rotation symmetry by any angle. So let us sketch the, for example, component ER of the electrostatic field. So ER will be this one, like that. Okay. Because of the rotation, rotation symmetry, we can consider uh, ER a point P as well as line gamma. Line gamma, point capital P, and ER a point capital P, we consider this as a solid object. 
So if we start to move them, they move together. Okay, suppose that they are a solid object and they can move together. So if we do that and we apply a rotation by any angle around gamma, about gamma, obviously what we find out is that this ER here, when we rotate this whole construction, will move and will become this new ER at this point P prime. And if we rotate it further, it will become this ER at this point capital P double prime. All right. So this is true because of our first rotation, of our first symmetry, the rotation symmetry about gamma. Okay, this is the origin, the center of, uh, uh, of this, uh, let's call it O prime, to distinguish from this O here, of this construction. Similarly here, actually let's just call it O, I think it's better. It can be the same as that. All right, so now here, let's do the same thing, but instead of using the rotation symmetry, so here we use again the rotation symmetry by any angle, okay? Instead, let us use another auxiliary line. Let us use an auxiliary line here. Okay, this auxiliary line, let's call it gamma translation. For example, this circle here, we could call it gamma rotation. So when we rotate this gamma rotation, um, actually, this remains gamma, project about that. So this gamma rotation is just to, to identify the rotation symmetry, whereas this straight line parallel to gamma, we use it to identify the translation symmetry up and down. Okay, so with this gamma t here, so let's sketch Again, our ER component, which is the same as that. Okay. Uh, so if we perform now a translation by any quantity, by any displacement, upward or downward, for example, we can go upward from this observation point capital P to another point, let's say here, this one would be capital P prime. So if now we consider ER at point capital P and gamma as a solid object and we translate it upward by this displacement, we obtain again a field ER at that point capital P prime. We can also translate it downward to a point capital P double prime. And in this case, on gamma T, we obtain this component ER, okay? All right, so the combination of the rotation and translation symmetry, what do they tell us? The first one tells us that if ER exists, has to be the same at each point on a line of the type gamma R because of the rotation symmetry about gamma. This symmetry tells us that if ER exists, has to be the same at each point on this line gamma T. So when we combine these two pieces of information together, they tell us that if ER exists, has to be the same at each point, capital P, on the lateral surface of any cylinder characterized by gamma as its central axis, like this cylinder. So at any point on the lateral surface of this cylinder, if ER exists, it has to be the same at each point, okay? And of course, if we move further out, it has to be the same, so we make a bigger cylinder, ER has to be the same at each point on this new cylinder. Nothing we know about uh, the difference between ER in a smaller cylinder or bigger cylinder, okay? This we don't know yet. This eventually we can find it out by means of Gauss's theorem. All right, but that's the first thing we know. So, now we analyzed the first component, ER of these three components. What about, for example, the component E bar phi? So this would be the component E bar phi, okay? So let's write here, this is ER, this is E bar phi, and of course, if we perform a rotation, it will be the same. Here, we will have the same E bar phi, and here we will have the same E bar phi. What about Z? This is Z, it's Z, it will be the same at each point on this 
line gamma r. If we go to the translation uh, symmetry scenario with gamma t, this will be our, uh, let's say, e phi. And of course, if we translate it upward, we're going to obtain exactly the same value. Similarly, for e z, we obtain the same value everywhere. Okay, so this means that by means of these two symmetries, if not only r, but also e bar phi and e z, if they exist, if all of them exist, they have to be the same at each point, capital P on the lateral surface of any cylinder which, is, uh, which has gamma as its own axis. All right. So now that we have all in place, we can call this point capital P. This point is capital P prime. And this point is capital P double prime on gamma R, whereas here, this point is point capital P. This point is capital P double prime. And this point is uh, capital P, let's call this one prime, and this one let's call it double prime. Doesn't matter. All right. Great. So this is the origin O. So now we only made use of two of the three symmetries. And now from this, the only thing we can tell is this statement in between here. Is that sufficient to solve this problem? Obviously not. The next thing we want to do is to verify self consistently which one of these components really exists by means of the last symmetry, the rotation about the pivot of prime. So how do we do that? I'm going to do a sketch down here, which is our self-consistent check. So in this case, this is our line gamma, somewhere up here, this is our O, We do our usual circle here. This is our point capital P. Now, let's choose a pivot here, O prime. Not that this pivot could, if we wanted to, coincide with O, but for generality, I choose a pivot which is different than O. It's just for generality. All right. All right, so now let's consider to begin with the ER component of the electrostatic field, which is this, okay? So we have a point capital P, this is my ER, this is the origin. The first symmetry I want to use actually is the last one, we didn't use it yet, let's use it. And so in order to do that, we need to take, this is our line gamma, this is ER, we flip them over by pi or minus pi, and so in this case, we will obtain something like something like that. So it points in that direction. So we end up somewhere with a new center exactly with this distance down here. Okay, this is our new center. So we're going to have uh, exactly something like this. Okay, so we're going to get this here, so I'm into this rotation. Okay, beautiful. So here, there. So this is our first symmetry, which is a rotation by pi or minus pi, step one, about this pivot O prime. Great. Now let's use the translation symmetry in step two. We want to bring this point upward all the way here. This is our step two. And so this is our rigid body. We bring it up and that's what we end up having up here. Finally, we want to use a rotation about the gamma line itself. And so in this case, for example, we can do the rotation of the arbitrary. So in this case, we do the gain of pi. Okay, which brings this vector back to where we started. Great. So we begin with a vector like this, we flip it, go up, translate it up, rotate it, and we restart with the same vector. This vector ER with which we started is obviously consistent with all three symmetries. 
Great. What about, let's do for example, it's z. So let's consider it's z, which is this quantity here. So this is our it's z. Now it's z, we need to pivot it around the prime. So it will become this. When we rotate the line and z, like this, it will become this. So it flips. So this is it's z at this new point. Step one. Step two, we bring it upward by this displacement. That's what we obtain here. Step three, we rotate it by pi around the line gamma itself. And so in this case, interestingly enough, we obtain this new z. Huh. This z points exactly in the opposite direction of the one we started with. What does it mean? It means that this z is not consistent with all the three symmetries. It's not. The only way that this is possible, that we start with a vector, vector pointing upward and we end up with a vector pointing downward, is when it's z is identically equal to zero. Because if it's just a dot, a dot becomes a dot, becomes a dot, becomes a dot. A dot is consistent, but a vector is not. So only a dot can be consistent, which means it's z has to be zero. All right, so it's z is inconsistent, okay? With all three symmetries. This is great because we can tell for sure that it z cannot exist. It has to be zero. So, so far we only need to find er by means of some other law, which is going to be Gauss's theorem. It z is zero. Now, what about the most complicated one, perhaps, is e phi, e bar phi. Well, this one, in fact, I let you think about it, and we can discuss if you want in piazza about this e bar phi. But I can tell you that it's also inconsistent, which means it has to be also equal to zero. But prove it to me. So both e bar phi and z are inconsistent, which means they have to be zero. So only er can be different than zero. So now we can actually put to complete this uh, picture here. This was the original point, the original point capital P. This point down here, it's point capital P prime. This is capital P double prime. And these are the three symmetries we are using to show consistency. All right, so now we are in a position that we can say that E of P actually can only be E of R. How do we compute now quantitatively that E of R by means of Gauss's theorem? So now we know that only ER is the, ER is the only component of the electrostatic field that we need to compute. Finally, let us use Gauss's theorem. So this is pretty easy. Let's say that this one is uh, the height of this cylinder, which I already sketched here nicely. This is H, so the height of this cylinder. And let's say that uh, uh, we need to use a closed surface, as we know from a previous video, to use Gauss's theorem. So what is the closed surface that we use? It's going to be capital sigma. It's a closed surface, which is comprised in this case for this cylinder of three surfaces. The two bases, which we're going to call capital sigma 1 <coughs> and capital sigma 2. And the other surface, which we're going to call simply capital sigma 2L. Let me just put it somewhere here. Capital sigma L. All right. The reason why I want you to put it there, because I want to identify this capital sigma L, an infinitesimal surface element, which would be of this type. Okay, so this infinitesimal surface element is what we need now to compute, to calculate ER. All right, so sigma is given by the union of sigma 1 with sigma L, which stands for lateral surface of the cylinder and sigma 2, where sigma 1 and sigma 2 are the top and bottom, the bottom and top bases respectively. All right, so we know the Gauss's theorem tells us that the surface integral on any, in this case, uh, the closed surface capital sigma of E dot MBA has to be equal to the total charge within this uh, cylinder. So let's, before going there, Let's start to calculate, to split this integral into three sub-integrals. 
All right, so we have the integral on sigma 1 as well as sigma 2 of the same integral, which I'm not going to rewrite is the same thing. Is this actually uh, something which will contribute to the Gauss theorem? Well, not. And why is that? Because er on the two bases, this is for example is er on sigma 1, is definitely a normal to the uh, unit vector associated with this area, with this surface, which is like this, the normal unit vector. So this is normal to that. So we are on the surface here, and m is obviously normal to that, and similarly up here, which means this integral will give us, both of them will give us zero, both on sigma one and sigma two. So we are only left with the integral on the lateral surface, sigma l. And that's why we need this infinitesimal element on such a surface. How do we compute that? Well, we know that if ER exists from the symmetry arguments, and we know that it should, it has to be the same at each and every point on the lateral surface of any cylinder, including sigma L, which has gamma as an axis, which means ER, we know its direction is UR, the amplitude, the magnitude has to be the same on each point of the cylinder, which means we don't have to integrate it because it has to be a constant. So ER, we can take it outside the sign of the integral. Okay, so then we still want to compute the, uh, uh, the, the integral of the flux, so the direction of E, which is also constant, is UR, okay? We need to dot this with uh, this oriented infinitesimal element, and we know that in this case, the normal unit vector N is actually equal on the lateral surface, and L is equal to UR, okay? Which means we need to dot this NL, in this case on the lateral surface, N is an L, is given by UR, okay? Which also we can take outside the sign of the integral, so we took care of E, of, its, of the magnitude of E, its direction, of N, which is an L, that is UR, and now we need to do the integral on the A, which in a cylindrical coordinate system, on the lateral surface is going to be the integral, uh, if this one is the center here of this cylinder, this is h, we need to integrate from minus h half to plus h half, okay, because this is the center, so half and half. So from minus h half to plus h half in dz, because the infinitesimal element, let's write the infinitesimal element dA in a cylindrical coordinate system, this dA here is nothing but um, dz, the height, times this little arc, so th this is dz, times this little arc, which is nothing but r, the distance between o and this element, times d r phi, okay? All right, so let's use it here, so dz, we already did it, and then we have the integral uh, of r, d r phi, between 0 and 2 pi. And note that r also, we can take it outside because it does not depend on phi. So the result of this integral eventually is 2 pi r h half minus minus h half is 2 times h half, which is h. So 2 pi r h, and this gives us 1. So we get 2 pi r h, 2 pi r h times er. Okay, er, 1, h, 2 pi r. Good. Gauss's theorem now, now the physics comes here, of Gauss's theorem. This has to be the same as 1 over epsilon naught, the total charge contained within this uh, uh, cylinder, which is uh, uh, nothing but, since lambda is constant, we don't need to integrate it, is lambda times h. Okay, Coulomb over meter meter, yeah, that makes sense. h and h cancels out, therefore, we find that ER, the magnitude of ER, the direction of already know it, obviously, has to be lambda divided by 2 pi epsilon not R, which is exactly the same result we found in the previous video using Coulomb's theorem, sorry, Coulomb's law and the superposition principle. So this is our result for ER. And of course, if we want the vector, the vector, we write it in this fashion. All right, so as you have seen here, I spent 30 minutes discussing about the symmetry arguments, 
in three minutes discussing the Gauss's theorem. What does it tell us? It tells us that Gauss's theorem is only a slightly little bit of this whole problem. Whereas typically students and many other people think that this all Gauss's theorem and then with some symmetry arguments we get this result. Not at all. You must absolutely first go through all the effort of understanding the symmetry arguments and then you can use Gauss's theorem. In fact, let's stop for one minute before concluding about that. Meditate about the following points. Suppose that you didn't use the symmetry arguments. You could think, mm, all right, I'm doing Gauss's theorem, let's say, on this surface, uh, capital uh, sigma 2. Good. So now we know that this uh, surface is oriented in this fashion, pointing upward, all right? I have these three components, r, phi, and z. Obviously, in this case, er does not contribute because it's normal. E phi does not contribute. Huh, but already here, I start with a problem. What about e z? Problem one. So issues not using symmetries. The first issue that we encounter is that here, if we use this uh, Gaussian surface on sigma capital sigma two similar similarly for one, if we know nothing about it z, there is nothing we can do because there would be an unknown contribution, because we don't know what is it here, we don't know what is it there, we cannot tell anything about it. So there would be an unknown contribution there would be an unknown contribution to flux. Okay, in fact even if you use symmetry arguments partially, and you say, oh, okay, I have a z here, uh, and a z uh, here, which, uh, no, I take it back. If you use symmetry arguments, of course, you can solve the problem. The problem is, what I'm trying to say, if you do not use at all symmetry arguments, you don't know what is uh, this z component that is capital sigma two, therefore, this, uh, since it's parallel to this unit vector here, uh, which it characterizes sigma, capital sigma two, I cannot compute the flux if I don't know what is it. I cannot compute the flux. All right. So this is the most complicated, the, the biggest problem uh, that you would have encountered if you were not to use the symmetry arguments. But there are some other more subtle problems, which is worth discussing here. For example, if I were to consider the lateral surface, okay? So I'm considering now the lateral surface, all right? And let's consider E bar phi. Hmm. E bar phi is normal to the uh, unit vector, the normal unit vector at capital sigma L, which is UR. So it drops out, so it's such that U phi is normal to UR, and so you would tempt you to say, oh, okay, it does not even be, it's not even featured in Gauss's theorem. So uh, when we perform the calculation, it goes out, and who cares about it? And the same thing actually would happen for EZ on sigma L. For both these on sigma, on capital sigma L, they seem not to contribute to Gauss's theorem. The fact, the fact that they do not contribute to this Gauss's theorem for this Gaussian surface does absolutely not mean that they are zero. It means that Gauss's theorem is blind, is blind with respect to them. This means that Gauss's theorem, at least, th is for theorem, at least for this Gaussian surface capital sigma, Okay, it's blind, it's blind with respect to e, phi, e bar phi and actually also for, with respect to, e, to e z, which means it, it can, you cannot tell anything about it. The fact that they drop out from Gauss's theorem means they could be whatever, they could be 100,000 and yet they drop out and you, were, you forgot about something which is a magnitude of 100,000 just because Gauss's theorem is blind to them. All right, you cannot just get rid of them like that, all right? The only way you can get rid of them is because from symmetry arguments, we know that they have to be zero. Otherwise, there is nothing you can tell about them. So this is a very subtle, yet a critical point that many people seem to completely forget about. Um, <clears throat> so to conclude, of course, you could think of using some other more complicated Gaussian surface which, uh, you know, if you use a more complicated one, you will see actually that uh, an unknown number phi would contribute to that surface for Gauss's theorem for that surface. 
And so you, you could clearly see more clearly that you cannot get rid of it, all right? Okay, so in this long video, we solved one of the most important problems in TIS242, which is that of an infinite straight line by means of symmetry arguments, three quarters of the solution, and tiny bit Gauss's theorem, all right? Now, the connection which we need to make again is between the symmetries and the rotational property, because actually, the rotational property of the electrostatic field is what is behind the symmetries, it's the same as the symmetries. And so, bottom line, we use the first two Maxwell's equations to solve this problem. The key was to use the three symmetries to show self-consistency between them. By means of this self-consistency, we were able to show that only ER can exist, and it has to be the same at each point on the lateral surface of the cylinder. Then you can use Gauss's theorem, which gives you the same result very uh, important result, lambda over 2 pi epsilon of r in the radial direction for this problem. And as a last note, in uh, later on, we will encounter a similar problem for a current on uh, when we will study the magnetostatic field B on a straight line. In that case, the current has a certain direction, okay? The current goes either up or down. So then, obviously, this will cause some problems for these symmetries because the, the line will not be the same if I flip it. Okay, because if there is a certain direction and I flip it, oh, I can see that the line changed, okay? Thank you.